came for us. And I, I'm going to end this sermon with a focus on joy and the Lord's Supper. And we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper today. And even though the word joy and rejoicing really isn't in the, the, the text per se, this is a text about joy. And uh, there's a lot of reasons for us to celebrate joy uh, around this text today. So I'm excited about that. But it's a short passage, and if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to ask you all, if you would and can, just to stand in honor of reading God's Word, and I'll read that. It'll be up on the screen as well. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me, and leaving everything, he rose and followed him, and Levi made made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. May God bless the reading of his word. Please be seated. In this brief encounter, Jesus opens the door really to eternal life, both by what he says and by what he does. Uh, today, I want to give you some lessons from Jesus, if you will. Uh, I, with those lessons, there'll be a truth that, that precedes it and then a lesson from the text, there'll be three of those as we go through. The first one is Jesus' choice, and we see that in those first two verses in 27 and 28. Uh, it says there, after he went out, he saw the tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me, and he leaving everything, he rose up and followed him. In, in these two verses, we see Jesus t choose a tax collector to join his merry group of fishermen. He's picking an IRS agent, right? Every time we hear those three letters together, IRS, we get this warm, fuzzy feeling, don't we? Mm, not so much. And, and this is very true about uh, <laughs> the same thing in those days. His, his name is recorded as Levi here in, in Mark's gospel as well. Um, he, he was most likely then probably a, a member of the tribe of Levi, and if you're in the tribe of Levi, you're supposed to go on to be a priest. He didn't go into the family business. He went out on his own. He was going to be a tax collector. And just to let you know, if any of you folks have children that are a little rebellious, just know this has been happening from the beginning of time. It happens. You're in company. So the story is, like I mentioned, it's in Mark's gospel. It's in Matthew's gospel as well. He actually calls himself Matthew in his gospel. And, and what I'm saying is that Matthew of the gospel of Matthew and this guy named Levi are the same person. They're, they're the same one and one here. And we know that from different parts of the text. But I, I suspect like um, Jesus did with Peter, Remember, his name was Simon, and then he changed it to Peter, which means rock. I think some point in time, Levi had his name changed by Jesus. And we don't know this. It's not recorded. I'm, I'm speculating, but I'm pretty sure that Matthew prob or Levi, Jesus changed Matthew, Levi's name to Matthew. Got that out. This is why I tell you this. Did you know Matthew means gift of God? <laughs> the IRS agent is the gift of God. <laughs> Isn't Jesus funny? I mean, he just does stuff that's just off the hook. He's, but he, he does this. He does this because Jesus sees beyond who you are today, right? He, to, he sees who you can be tomorrow, right? Jesus sees beyond you and where you are today and sees where you are and can be tomorrow. Let me share a little bit about tax collecting in the Roman Empire during these occupation days in Israel. Basically, it was called tax farming, okay? This means a, tax, a guy could come to the Roman government and, say, I, I, and bid on being a tax collector. And basically, the job would go to the highest bidder. 
And then Rome would then collect what they needed. But this was literally a perfect breeding ground for, like, extortion. <laughs> okay? It really is. And so there was actually two types of tax back in those days. There was a thing called a poll tax, which was partly just because you were alive, you had to pay tax. Uh, there was ground tax associated with that. It means one-tenth of, of the things that you farm would and have would go to the government. And there was an income tax also, and the earnings of the things that you sell would be uh, an income tax as well, about 1%. Uh, but there was a second group of taxes that they could levy as well, and those were duties and tolls. This is where they would uh, charge fees for using roads or harbors or docking and those type of things. And this is where they really made their money, apparently. Uh, there would be even sales tax on things as well. So tax collectors in that day and age were most of them were very, very rich. But they were also hated by their fellow Jews. They were considered traitors. In fact, in, in the book of the Talmud, which is a very special book amongst the Jewish people, uh, they were numbered uh, and identified as thieves and robbers if you were a tax collector. In fact, you were excommunicated from the synagogue and were consider, considered essentially dregs of society if you were a tax collector. Levi and his friends are literally the lowest of the low in society. Now, with that background, you can maybe better understand what the scenario we just read a few minutes ago and about how important what Jesus just does and says in this scene. Think about it. Jesus has amassed a group of Galilean fishermen, now a tax collector, talk about a motley crew, right? <laughs> Seriously. Somebody needs to talk to Jesus about who he's hanging out with, right? And they do. <laughs> they question him in just a minute. We saw that or we read that. And so we, we begin to see that Jesus, though, he came for us. That's the, the sermon title. Again, he came for us. Us is where I want to hang out for a moment. Who is us? Us is everybody, to be quite honest with you. It is the uneducated fisherman. It is the tax collector. It's the guy in jail. It's the nobody. It's the worst of worse. That's us. The Apostle Paul understood this through his, his uh, understanding from Jesus about his own ministry. Paul did. He, he saw himself, okay? He knew he was a, a highly educated man. But he also understood that he was ultimately a Christian killer and imprisoned Christians, right? Now he's the chief church planter for <laughs> Jesus, going through Asia Minor, planting churches all over the place. The most unlikely of candidates. Listen to what Paul writes to the church in Corinth. This is in his first letter. Chapter 1, it's verse 26. He says, for consider your calling. And let me just pause for just a minute. When he says calling here, this was, he's not talking to a group of pastors that got called to preach the gospel and be pastors. He's, just, he's talking about your calling as a Christian. He says, consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were noble of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in this world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in this world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in this world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. Hmm. Jesus should have never been able to change the world with the group of people he chose. <laughs> A group of fishermen. Some tax collectors? Are you kidding me? But why? And if you read on to the next verse, he tells you why. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. I have nothing to do with my salvation outside of saying yes and accepting the gift that God has given to me. But why else would he choose such a motley crew as I see before me? You guys are good. Because, again, like I said earlier, the Lord sees your potential. 
He sees what's inside of you, inside your heart. And God calls the most odd and most unlikely into his kingdom. We, we see that from the Bible, right? From the, the earliest Bible uh, scriptures. Really, when we talk about Abraham, or Abram who's his name, he was an idol worshiper when God called him out of his land. He was an idol worshiper. I, I love the story of Gideon, okay? He, Gideon is called the man of valor, okay? He was a, a warrior, but when God called him, you remember where he was? He was hiding, from his enemies. Literally, he was winnowing wheat, okay? That's when you take a winning horse, throw it up in the air, and let the wind blow the chaff away, and the wheat falls to the ground. You know where he was doing that? He was doing that in a valley, so nobody would see him, where there's no wind. It didn't really work. You see, God always uses, always uses the most unlikely people. He calls anybody. And so here's the truth I want you to, to, to simply see, and that God calls the most unlikely. It wasn't likely, and you can ask any of the people I grew up with, that I would be a Christian, let alone a pastor. Highly unlikely. But it's not about us. It's about God working in us. And all those people putting their faith and trust in God, they did it imperfectly, but they did it, didn't they? So here's the lesson I want you to take away here. So if this is the way God chooses No one is disqualified to receive the gift of God's love and transforming power. Nobody is disqualified. Nobody. Sometimes people feel unworthy. They say, oh, well, I'll I'll go to church. Maybe you've talked to people like this. I'll go to church when I get my act together a little bit more. Mm -mm, Mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. That ain't it. (laughs) Because listen to what Levi does. Verse 28, and leaving everything, he rose and followed him. Did he, did he get his act together? No, he literally, that's all te- the text tells him. You see, he follows him immediately. And I know there's, uh, there's a lot of detail left out here, but it seems clear to me that Levi has left, uh, has been transformed in this, in this call. He leaves his job. He leaves his source of income. He starts walking around with this guy, Jesus, who's doing some miracles. And, and I, we don't know how much he knew about Jesus. I suspect he knew there was this guy named Jesus doing some miracles. And, and, and for whatever reason, he follows him immediately. He, here's the point, though. He leaves his old life for a new one. He leaves his old life for a new one. Now, if you were saved in your life when you were a teen or an adult, okay, like I was, this is profound. Because he literally says, leaving everything. How many of us who were saved as a teen or adult are trying to keep dragging along the things of our old life into our new life? And we ask, why am I troubled so much? Come on now, I'm stepping on some toes. We drag in our old life into our new life, and it doesn't fit. In fact, this is the next story in his gospel. And then we wonder why we struggle. Really be honest with yourself. What do you still need to let go of today? What's weighing you down? What's holding holding you back in your relationship with Jesus? What's stopping the transformation that you so want to see in your life? Today we'll have opportunity to add more prayers to the prayer stretcher. And maybe you'll do that today and ask God for help in this. this. This, I understand, folks. I know this doesn't always happen instantaneously like we see it here in this text. And, and we don't know all the different things that he had to work through as well. It's a process. It, it's what we call at our church here releasing our heart to God. And it's an ongoing thing that we do and, and an ongoing practice that we do to re- continue to release things in our, uh, that are holding us back in our relationship with Christ. And we see Levi doing that in this instant. He leaves everything. And so the, the, the first lesson was about the choice of Jesus, but it leads us, leads us right to a choice as well because Jesus chose us. The second lesson from Jesus here, is Jesus' heart in man. Jesus' heart in man. 
Levi does something awesome. It, it truly reflects Jesus' uh, heart, I think. In verse 29, it says, Levi made him a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. Levi is throwing a coming-out party. He is coming out of the tax business and going into the Jesus business, right? He really is. He needs throwing a party about it. He is psyched about this. And he calls all his tax collector buddies to come along. To be honest, nobody else would go <laughs> because they were that much of the dregs of the society. But he had enough to fill what it says, a large company in his house. And I truly believe this was an evangelistic house party for the worst of sinners in his town. Even though we don't hear any conversions, the fact that he threw the party represents that Levi has the heart of Jesus. He threw the party. I believe personally that this was his act of repentance. Compare it to the other tax collector in Scripture we heard about. Well, we haven't, we haven't read it before, but Zacchaeus, the wee little man, the vertically challenged guy who had to climb a tree to see Jesus. Yeah, he was a tax collector too. And the Bible tells us that he actually gave four times back to the people he ripped off. That was his repentance. But I would, I would argue today that this party that, that Levi threw, this was essentially his act of repentance because we're going to go back to that in the text because Jesus mentions that word. I want us to see the heart of Jesus and how Jesus looks at the sinner. Okay? It's not in disgust. He looks at us and he sees someone that needs forgiveness. That's what Jesus sees when he sees every one of us. And Levi wanted others to experience what he had, a new life and forgiveness from Christ. So here's the truth I want you to wrestle with a little bit. Our salvation is worth celebrating. It is worth celebrating. I, 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 I'm rethinking how we baptize and when people get, man, we need to celebrate this more. This is incredible. Our salvation is worth celebrating. And, and not to forget, we are forgiven sinners looking to grow the kingdom with sinners who want to be forgiven. That's now our job. That is what God calls us to. We are sinners who want to be forgiven. Levi was actually doing what he had learned that week. And he was doing what we learned last week. He was literally tearing off roofs. Really? He was just packing people into his house. But more uh, uh, metaphorically, he was tearing off roofs, right? He, he was going to extremes to make sure these guys he tax collected with knew about Jesus. He was inviting them all to the house. He was paying for this party. He was putting it all the line. He, he had to put himself in a place where he was going to feel uncomfortable. He was willing to pay the cost. He was willing to tear off roofs to, to see that people had the opportunity to hear about Jesus. One of the things we find most interesting one of the things I find most interesting is the comparison to last week's story where we talked about the paralytic. And the paralytic gets healed and gets, gets forgiven, but here the only one we hear about here is, is Levi. He's got a house full of people that are here listening to Jesus. And I've had many of the, the tax collectors probably, you know, left that party going, man, Matthew... He's gone off the deep end. He's gone nuts. He's, he's going to leave all this money all behind and follow this guy from Nazareth? Are you kidding me? Hey, I, I'm going to bid on his tax job. I mean, I, I, I don't know. We don't hear what happened in the story. I suspect that's maybe what happened. But we, I, I think maybe we don't hear about it because that isn't the emphasis. That isn't the lesson God wants us to, to, to focus on. But rather, he wants to hear the heart that deeply desires to share with others new life with Jesus. I think that's what he wants us to, to, to hang on to. And God calls all of his father's followers, in a sense, to, to identify with, Ma with Matthew here, with Levi here. That you, you don't want to go to heaven alone. <laughs> you want to bring some people along with you, right? 
and you'll be willing to tear off a few roofs that go, that go along the way. And so here's the, here's the lesson. With the heart of Jesus, Levi, not wanting to go to heaven alone, threw a party. Be willing to go to extremes to bring others with you to heaven. Be willing to go to a little extreme. I'll, I'll share one story. Uh, this was in the beginning of our ministry when I was first here. Um, and uh, I was in a coffee shop, and I'm having coffee, and I'm working and doing my thing. And I, this couple was behind me, and um, they're discussing their relationship. And I could hear them, and the relationship was not good. Um, and I, I, whatever reason, God put on my heart, man, and, and this was like traumatic for me. <laughs> this was tearing off some roof. God said, go, go speak to them. So I don't know this couple. They don't know me. And I just go up to them and say, hey, I'm a local pastor in the area. If you're having trouble with your marriage, I'd love to help you. They're like, well, we're getting divorced. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> I tell that story to say, you know what? Sometimes the tearing off the roof is just some of those awkward situations where if God is nudging you, follow the nudge. Follow the nudge. And that was really uncomfortable for me, even thinking about it. Sometimes that's what God means by tearing off a few roofs, right? We learn from Jesus' choices, right? And we've now learned to identify with Jesus' heart and man, okay, with that part of the story. Here's the third lesson I want us to learn. Jesus' mission and joy. Jesus' mission and joy. It says, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. This group of Pharisees, apparently, it seems like they approached the disciples. I think they probably come out of the party, the, the, the Pharisees would not have gone into the party. So that's, the party's probably over, they're leaving, and, and they approach Jesus' disciples, and not Jesus so much, I'm not too sure why that is, but they're grumbling, they have their hatred and their judgment out there, and they're, they're, they're saying, you know, if this Jesus you're following was a man of God, he wouldn't be hanging out with those type of people. Are you, why are you doing that? But really, that whole section in verse 30 and on there, Jesus is he's rejecting what I'm calling religious snobbery. <laughs> That's what he's doing. He, it, because Jesus knows this. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. Yeah, you know it. You know it. It's about relationship. And, and I can add that thought to this text with confidence because if you go into Matthew's gospel, Okay, when he writes about this story, he adds something. Listen to what he adds. He says, verse 13, go and learn uh, what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Hmm. I desire mercy. What's mercy about? Mercy is about relationship, isn't it? It's about blessing somebody that doesn't even want to be blessed. Sacrifice, what's that? That's about doing duty. It's about relationship. Jesus knew this. We talked about it and sang about it today. But the question comes, are we as a church guilty of snobbery? I, I, I hope and the way I see our church, I don't think we are. I, I think we do a pretty good job of that. But in general, the church throughout history has struggled with this. So let's not pat ourselves on the back too much. Let's be humble about this. I mean, you, all you have to do is go into the book of James, the, the church in Jerusalem, okay? If you remember, the apostle James was the pastor there, and he had to rebuke the people in that church because they were showing favoritism to the rich. They were. That's a, right there in the New Testament, one of the first books ever written in the New Testament. Historically, again, this has been an issue with the church, unfortunately. How many of you people know who the Salvation Army is, right? 
bell ringer Santa, ding, 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 ding. If it bothers you, get over it. <laughs> the leader of the Salvation Army, the man who started it, was a man named William Booth. Historian Richard Collar writes about Booth and his life and the starting of this ministry. And one of the things he talks about was something that happened in 1846 in the uh, Broad Street congregation in the church there. One Sunday, Booth did something, well, a little out of the ordinary. He took all the poor people in the town and ushered them in to the best seats in the house. Run the center. You see, that wasn't the way it was done. The way it was done is if you were poor, you came in a side door. You sat in the back corner. Your seat was a bench, had no backing, had no cushion because you were poor. Hmm. The church had become respectable, right? The church is a place for the sick. It's a hospital for the sick, not a hall for the redeemed. Sometimes we lose that perspective. I don't want our church to ever lose that perspe perspective. That anybody that walks into the place and wants to learn about God is welcome to come and learn about God. It doesn't matter about their background. It doesn't matter how much money they make. It doesn't matter what their skin color looks like. It doesn't matter. If they want to come into this house and learn about God, they're welcome. If they want to come join one of our small groups, I want them to. I hope we never, ever lose that, that we feel and are welcoming to everyone. That doesn't mean we ignore sin, okay, and we, we, we're, we're not standing to the, the standards of Scripture that teach us. But it is saying that we are standing to the standards of Scripture that he came for us. Us includes Everybody. And if they want to hear the Word of God and learn the Word of God, they are welcome here. Amen and amen. So again, in verses uh, 31, it says, Jesus answered them, those who have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, okay? I'm not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Jesus makes this seems... Uh, to these Pharisees, an, an obvious statement, okay? It, it, if you're not sick, you don't need a doctor, right? I'm a doctor. You don't need me. I've come for the sick. What they fail to understand, what these Pharisees fail to understand, is that we are all sick, <laughs> okay? We, we are all infected with a curable disease called sin, right? Right? The Pharisees were perfect law followers, and in, in their eyes, they were not sick. Mm. Here's where I want Joy to kind of wrap in and come into this message. Matthew, literally, again, he's throwing a party because he's overjoyed with his new life in Jesus. And, and he wants others to, to share in this and to know about this new life. This is a joy-filled party. So let me share joy from this text. Advent joy, as you will. And so some reasons for Advent joy, I think, come in that last verse, in verse 32, that I have, I have not uh, come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Here's the truth I want you to walk away with. Joy comes in the fact that we are all in the same boat and desperate situation and all have the same solution to the same problem. We're all in the same boat and we all have the same solution to the same problem. And here it is. Learn to joyfully live a life of repentance. To joyfully live a life of repentance. How do we do this? It starts out by understanding just what Jesus was trying to make his point about. Romans 3.10 says that where it is written, no or none is righteous, no, not one. No one is righteous. The, that is the theme from Psalm 14 and Psalm 53, almost verbatim. And then Paul goes on to say, 
in that same chapter, starting in verse 22, he says, and the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, okay? There is no distinction, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Like I said before, this message is entitled, He Comes for Us. Us is we are all sinners, okay? Joy is that we're justified. We are justified and forgiven. We're made innocent and right before God because of His grace, His unmerited favor to us, and so then we call it a gift that He offers. This is why we celebrate Christmas, The joy is also in the redeeming, the fact that he paid for our sins and the sacrifice on the cross. All done by Jesus. This is why we celebrate, and I want us to celebrate the Lord's Supper today. I want us to celebrate the Lord's Supper today with really with great joy during this Advent season. The verse I want us to think about as we celebrate actually comes from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. It says, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Mm. Joy focused on his advent, on his first arrival, because when he came into this earth as a baby and then grew up, he, all, he came always for one purpose, and that was for our redemption. To conquer and have the victory over sin that we and you, um, you and I can be forgiven of sin. If you believe, if you believe in this, if Jesus is your Savior, you are welcome to join us for the Lord's Supper. If you haven't yet had a relationship with Jesus, I would ask you to abstain. This is a gift, a celebration that is given to God's people. The way I want to do it today is I want you to come and take the elements here in just a moment. As you come, I want you to focus on that verse. It's still up there good. Focus on that verse, the joy set before him. Okay? Take the elements back to your seat, hold on to them, and then I'll lead us in taking them together in just a moment. Okay? Take time to reflect on the joy set before Jesus. That joy was a cross. But it wasn't the cross itself. It was what was going to be accomplished on that cross. The joy he saw with people like Matthew who started following him. The Bible tells us that when one sinner gets saved, that there's joy in heaven. Jesus rejoices every time somebody says yes and accepts his gift. That's joy. Reflect on that time in your life, maybe. I want you to come. And if you also have a prayer you'd like to add to our prayer mat, this would be a time to do it as well. And so let me open up the communion here.
it is today with great joy that we celebrate the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. Incredible joy. And well, again, this also represents great suffering. It also represents great redeeming. It represents incredible forgiveness. He calls us to do it, well, as often as we can, ultimately. And so we gather today, celebrating in the joy that Christ has given us, remembering the night when he was with his disciples. In Matthew 26, it says, now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink it again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Lord Jesus, we thank you and we bless you. We are blessed because of you. We are blessed because we can remember your great sacrifice for us, the great forgiveness that has been given to us. It is worthy of great celebration that we can be numbered among your family, uh, called your children, lifted up and blessed. So, Lord, I pray that you would indeed help us Help us to not forget, to walk away, move today because of your great love for us, because you have redeemed us, you have forgiven us our sins, and let us celebrate in our hearts every day the great forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And everybody says, amen.